Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are from the Modern Slavery team um, from Enfield Council. My name is Sherry Sully. It's going to be myself and my colleague, Emina Arif. We are modern slavery investigators in this team, and we're going to be going through a modern slavery awareness session with you this morning. So modern slavery is an umbrella term which includes human trafficking, slavery, servitude and forced or compulsory labour. Human trafficking is the recruitment, movement, harbouring or receiving of children, men or women, and that can be through the use of force, coercion, abuse of vulnerability, abuse of power, deception. There are various means that are used to do this, but it's always for the purposes of exploitation. I'm just going to bring up a video clip for you, if you just bear with me a moment, please. Just going to take you back to the slides, if you should bear with me a moment. Okay, so there are a couple of video clips that we show throughout these sessions. Um, so that particular one you just saw there just showed a variety of different types of exploitation in different settings around us in our community and where we might come across them. Um, we feel that the videos are quite useful in these sessions because sometimes they can kind of trigger you to look into a situation that you might be in a little bit more deeply than you otherwise would have, and it might make you notice something that you otherwise wouldn't have. So the Modern Slavery Act 2015, there were some changes made on this in that the, um, the Act has increased the maximum custodial sentence for offenders um, to life, so it was previously 14 years. The Act gives courts powers to impose orders and restrict the activities of suspected traffickers so they don't get lost in the process. It gives victims extra protection for um, against prosecutions for offences that they might have committed as part of their exploitation. So an example of this would be for county lines or any other type of criminal exploitation. It also provides victims with access to civil legal aid. The Act itself states that an offence is committed if someone holds another in slavery or servitude or requires them to perform forced or compulsory labour. So where we work for the local authority, we would be something that is called a first responder. We do have a slide at the end of this session with a list of all the first responders. And what that basically means is under Section 52 of the Modern Slavery Act, we have a duty to report. Um, and that report is made to the Secretary of State if we believe somebody to be a victim of modern slavery or human trafficking. So we will go over the referral process a little bit later on in these slides. So human trafficking, for something to be considered a human trafficking crime with adults, these three components need to be present. So they are the act, the means and the purpose. So the act is the recruiting or movement of people the means is what is used to do that. So as I mentioned earlier, force, fraud, coercion, deception, you know, abuse of power, etc. And the purpose is always for exploitation, regardless of the type. So with children, this is slightly different in that the means component doesn't need to be present for it still to be considered a human trafficking crime, as long as the act and the purpose are there. The reason for that is that a child can't give informed consent in the same way that an adult can. Um, so according to the Modern Slavery Act, a person commits an offence if the person arranges or facilitates the travel of another person with the view to them being exploited. So even if that person 
isn't involved in the actual exploitation process itself, but their sole purpose of this operation is to pick up this person from address A and drop them to address B. And they know when they're met by somebody else at address B that they're going to be exploited. They are still actually committing a crime by taking them there. It's also irrelevant if the person consents to the travel or not. They may be consenting because they've been threatened. Even if they haven't directly been threatened, they may be afraid of what's going to happen to them or maybe a family member if they don't kind of go along with what's being expected of them. Um, quite often children are trafficked for the same reasons as adults. Um, some additional reasons with children can be for things such as illegal adoption. It could be for benefit fraud, cannabis cultivation, street crimes such as pickpocketing, shoplifting, begging, that type of thing. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's ever seen um, when somebody is begging on the street, sometimes they will have a child or a baby present with them. That's not to say, of course, that none of those cases are going to be genuine, because unfortunately, some of them will be. But we do know that it is a tactic that is used because it's going to pull on people's heartstrings more and ultimately they're going to make more money from it. Um, so the next slide just highlights some differences between smuggling and trafficking, because sometimes we do hear these terms used interchangeably, especially in the media. So the crime with trafficking is against the individual because they are being trafficked in order to be exploited. With smuggling, it's against the state because somebody is crossing a border without the state's knowledge. The relationship with trafficking. That person is purely there to be exploited as a form of making money, and that is their sole purpose. With smuggling, it's more that one person is providing another with a service. The length of time with trafficking, because it's exploitative, it's usually going to be longer term because they will exploit somebody over and over again to kind of um, maximise the amount of money they can make out of them. With smuggling, it's voluntary, it's short term until they've crossed that border. Similarly, with the profit, um, because of the nature of what's happening with trafficking, it's usually um, ongoing because they will re-exploit them over and over again. With smuggling, it's a one-off payment for that service. And finally, the borders. So with smuggling, it wouldn't always need to be across a border to be considered smuggling. With trafficking, it can be across a border. It can be within the same country. It can literally be within the same street. Um, and it would still be considered uh, trafficking. When we're looking at the global, the UK picture, you know, more specifically for us, the Enfield picture, it's very, very difficult to get statistics in this area. Um, we know that the scale of modern slavery is very, very significant, and we know from the data we are receiving that the figures are going up year on year. We also know that there's a strong link between modern slavery and organised crime. So that would be one of the reasons why people wouldn't be forthcoming with information. Quite often, um, even when people are actually out of the exploitative situation, and they've come through the other side, they still don't want to discuss what's happened to them either because they've had threats along the way and they're afraid to or because of the you know what they've experienced along the way has been so traumatic that they actually don't want to relive the experience by having to discuss it with various professionals over and over again throughout the referral process. Um, another barrier to people reporting this type of crime also is that quite often people don't recognize themselves as victims of modern slavery. So sometimes the, the life somebody may be used to might have been so bad that ironically, um, as a modern slave, they, they might see it as a step up to what the life that they're actually used to, either because they're earning more money or because they have a roof over their head or, for example, they can feed an addiction. There are various different reasons um, as to why somebody may not identify as a victim or as being exploited. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few statistics just to kind of put things into perspective a little bit. So in 2016, it was estimated there were 45.5 million people in slavery globally at that time, and that was 10 to 13,000 in the UK. So just two years later in, in 2018, that 10 to 13,000 went up, estimate went up to 136,000. So we can only kind of estimate how much that figure would have gone up today. Um, we have a few statistics from the Met Police as well. Um, so in years 15, 16, the Met had received 270 modern slavery type referrals. In 16, 17, they had received 1,073. 
1718, they'd received 1,747. And in 1819, they'd received 2,346. So we can see from those figures as well that there is a definite significant increase in the number of referrals that are being received year on year. Um, and I think the way people are looking at modern slavery, it's obviously a working progress. Um, Whereas previously, for example, people that were uh, victims of criminal exploitation may have been looked at as criminals. The thinking is changing now and slowly, slowly, you know, people are starting to look at them as victims, which is what they are. So if they're being exploited and they're being forced into crime, then they are victims. Um, so this is changing as time's going on. So the last point we have on this slide is potential victims of human trafficking were reported from 130 different nationalities. And this came from National Crime Agency statistics from 2018. The reason we include that in these slides is just to highlight the fact that this uh, modern slavery and trafficking can happen to absolutely anybody. Because it happens in many, many different ways, it can affect any one of us. And I think sometimes there is this common misconception that it only happens to certain types of people, maybe from certain parts of the world or from certain ethnic backgrounds. If we're looking a little bit closer within the Enfield borough, maybe people from certain postcodes. And it's just not the case because it happens in so many different ways. Um, this next slide shows the top 10 nationalities that are reported as victims of modern slavery and human trafficking in the UK in order. So we can see that we have UK nationals at number one, we have Albanian nationals at number two and Vietnamese at number three, and then we have um, up to 10 listed there. Um, so we do know that with U UK nationals, they are more exploited for labour than any other type of exploitation. Um, we also know that with Albanian nationals, it's generally around sexual exploitation. And with Vietnamese nationals, again, it's generally more around labour exploitation than any other type. Um, so these particular um, statistics that we were looking at were from National Crime Agency statistics from 2019. Um, so when we looked at a gender breakdown for that year, there were 7,224 males that were reported and there were 3,391 females that were reported. So it was kind of almost half females to males that year. Um, when looking at that data a little bit more closely, we also saw that males were more reported for labour exploitation than any other type of exploitation. And with females, it was more around sexual exploitation than any other type. So it may be that males are more exploited in the UK um, than females and that's why those figures are reflecting that. There could also be an argument to say uh, with females because it's around sexual exploitation it may be that that type of exploitation is more hidden therefore more unnoticed and therefore more unreported um, which is just something to think about really. So those figures I just read out just over half of those individuals were exploited as adults which unfortunately means that 43% of them were also exploited as minors. So the point I made to do with this affecting any one of us, it does affect children in near enough the same way that it does affect adults. So when we're looking at Enfield's picture of modern slavery, it is actually slightly different to that of what it is nationally. So the highest type of um, exploitation referral that we get in Enfield is around sexual exploitation. And that accounts for 71% of our referrals. And that's followed by domestic servitude at 16% and forced labour at 13%. I'm just going to bring up the second video clip if you just bear with me a moment, please. Yeah, I did, thank you. What's going on? Yeah, absolutely. Can I, like, I'll call you back in a minute. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Bye. Don't look at it. Don't look at it. Don't look at it. Are you hungry? Are you able to work? Yeah. Oh, I can no prints. Yeah, yeah, look. Guess what? We've got a bit of fun for you, mate. Yeah, look. Yeah. Okay, I'm 
just going to take you back to the slides now. Okay, so that particular video we like to show in these sessions, so that, that focused on a homeless man being targeted for the vulnerability of being homeless um, and being exploited for his labour. Um, I think it's quite a powerful video, especially the bit at the end where it says, can you see me? It's one of those situations that any one of us could walk past any day of the week and we would look at and not necessarily think anything of. Would you see some men doing some some work, you know, building a, a brick wall or laying a doing a drive or whatever it is they're doing. And having seen this video, you might have noticed, for example, there was one man communicating on behalf of everybody else. So the people doing the actual manual work weren't talking. There was no eye contact with the customers. There was no conversation. They were just seen but not heard. Um, you might have noticed that they weren't wearing the correct protective equipment to be doing what they were doing, for example. Um, so that man had an injury. That injury would have gone untreated because they wouldn't want to raise suspicion by bringing him to hospital or, um, or giving him the opportunity to dis disclose what's happening to him to professionals, for example. So it might trigger things that you see. So, you know, un untreated injuries, you know, not wearing the correct protective equipment, etc. But we will go over this in a little bit more detail um, in the slides coming up. So what I'm going to do now is just go through the different types of exploitation and just give an explanation as to what each one is. So if you ever look at a situation and think, is this exploitation? I'm not really sure. The question to ask yourself would be, is anyone profiting unfairly at somebody else's expense? Now, that can be a financial benefit, but it doesn't have to be. It's just some type of benefit at somebody else's expense. So first we have sexual exploitation. So this is where somebody could be forced into either prostitution, pornography, escorting, just any type of sexual work against their will. Um, we then have forced labour. So this is where somebody's made to work against their will, again, for little or no pay. Um, as with any type of exploitation, they may face violence or threats. It could be towards them or their families. Quite often passports and ID um, are confiscated, which I think we saw in that video, and that is used as a form of control by exploiters. Um, quite often with labour exploitation, they'll be made to live in really terrible conditions with lots of other people. Um, you know, will be under constant threat. You know, quite often will be working very, very long hours, you know, seven days a week. It happens a lot in industries such as tarmacking, hospitality, food processing, construction, etc. Um, so then we have servitude. So domestic servitude is where somebody is working in a household. Um, so that will be doing things like cooking, cleaning, looking after children, looking after elderly relatives, you know, anything that they wanted doing within that household. Um, they may be very ill treated, subjected to humiliation. Um, again, working very long hours. They may not actually have any privacy or have a room of their own in the house. They may not have specific working hours, so they may really be essentially on call 24 hours a day. So if there's a baby or an elderly person, like I said, living in the house that needs that round the clock care, that person may be expected to do all the chores that they do throughout the day and then wake up throughout the night to um, to assist with that as well. They may receive no pay for what they're doing. Um, we heard of a lady that wasn't allowed to have a meal with the rest of the family at the kitchen table. She was made to sit on the floor and eat her food. So that's the kind of humiliation. You know, it could be physical violence as well. It could be verbal. Um, there are many things that kind of come into play with this. Sometimes people won't be allowed to have a mobile phone. So they won't be allowed to have that contact with the outside world, with their families, with their friends. Um, they won't be allowed to leave the house, sometimes not at all. It could be maybe they might only be allowed to leave the house with a chaperone. So everything they're doing is kind of being monitored. They're not allowed to have any contact with anybody outside the home to give them that opportunity to disclose anything. There is actually a difference between slavery and servitude. So I'm just going to highlight those differences. So servitude is the state of being under control of someone else and having no freedom. And slavery is actually being owned by another person and forced to work for them. So there is a heightened level of control with slavery. We've then got forced criminality and county line sits under that. So forced criminality is where victims are controlled and maltreated and forced to participate in a range of illegal activities, including pickpocketing, shoplifting, cannabis cultivation, county lines, 
Um, cannabis cultivation is the second most common form of criminal exploitation. Um, county lines is a term that is used to describe where gangs will recruit people to sell illegal drugs. So it's not just in counties around London, it can be in towns, it can be anywhere. And they will have a specific mobile phone, um, hence the line in county lines that is, it's, it's an untraceable phone that is used to arrange these um, transactions. So they will exploit vulnerable children and adults to do this. Um, but they will usually target somebody for some type of vulnerability. So with adults, it could be somebody with a mental health issue, an addiction, a homeless person, a learning difficulty, you know, somebody who's quite isolated and lives alone and may be easier to manipulate. Um, with children and adolescents, there is a correlation between children that are in the looked after children system in social care. Um, also absent parenting, truanting, um, and this type of involvement. Um, we have heard of children as young as 10 being involved in this. Um, so where we're talking about gangs, we're also talking about coercion, intimidation, um, sexual violence, weapons. So what they will do is they'll give that person an amount of drugs and they will give them an address and they will say, bring these drugs to this address and bring me back my money. What will happen a lot of the time, unfortunately, is that person will then be set up to be robbed for those drugs once they get to that address by the people that sent them there. They will then turn around and say to them, you now owe me £2,000 because you've lost my drugs. That's what's referred to as debt bondage. So it's a tactic that is used by exploiters to essentially hold that victim in that situation and make them feel that they now owe the exploiters so they can potentially exploit them in really horrific ways and get them to do things that they would never dream of doing because they now feel they have to do this because they're scared. Um, so these addresses where these transactions take place are called cuckooing addresses. Um, so again, sometimes exploiters will exploit people from a different angle. Um, they may take over an elderly person's house that lives on their own, for example. Um, take over their address by kind of befriending them. Again, it could be somebody with an addiction or um, a mental health issue or a learning disability, and they will take over that address and use it for this kind of activity. If that person then turns around and objects at any point and says they're going to go to the police, um, they will turn around and say, well, hang on a minute. If you go to the police, we're going to tell them that you were part of it and you're going to go to prison with us. So it's, a, it's another way of exploiting people from a different angle. We then have financial exploitation. So this is just, um, it could be bene where benefits are falsely claimed by perpetrators on behalf of their workers. It could be where bank accounts are opened in victims' names but used by perpetrators. Um, it could be where workers' wages are paid directly to exploiters, just any type of financial exploitation. Um, we then have forced marriage. So this is marriage without consent. So it's not the same thing as an arranged marriage. An arranged marriage would usually be arranged by families, but both parties would consent to what's happening. So forced marriage can happen for reasons such as citizenship. If somebody's coming from abroad um, and wants citizenship in that country, for example, or for domestic servitude reasons. So they might be forced to marry into a family and kind of be used to do all the chores and et cetera, possibly to repair debt. It could be, you know, for things um, like that. We have heard of these um, situations happening with quite young children as well. Um, so debt bondage, which I've already touched on, can be present in any type of exploitation. Another example of debt bondage could be, for example, if somebody lived in, in a really poor country um, and didn't have enough money to feed their family, for example. Somebody says to them, come over to the UK, I can get you a job in a factory making some aprons. You're going to make more money than what you're making over here and you can send it back to your family and your children are going to have a better life. So they come over to the UK in the hope for a better life for their family. The reality is when they get over here, you know, they're either put into a brothel and sold for sex or they're put into a cannabis factory and made to look after cannabis uh, plants and they're not allowed to leave that property or many, many different different types of exploitation they could be subjected to. They then turn around and say to that person, well, hang on a minute. I didn't know this is what you were going to get me to do. I, I don't want to be doing this. I want to leave and go back to my country, go back to my family. The exploiter will then turn around and say to them, well, 
your your children have now got a better life and that's because of me I gave you that and it cost me 500 pounds to get you over here so they've now accrued this so-called debt which was never discussed previously um, and they're now saying they have to work until they pay this person back but in reality the amount of money they're going to be left with once they've you know done all the the bare essentials for themselves they've sent back money to their family the exploiter has taken their cut out of their wage anyway is going to be so little it's going to take them such a long time to pay the exploiter back this so-called debt that they're essentially bonded by it so that's another tactic that is used to hold them in that situation um, so the last um, the rarest type of exploitation we have is organ harvesting um, but it does still happen all around the world so this is where people are trafficked um, in order for their internal organs, which is usually the kidney or the liver, to be harvested for transplant and sold on the black market. So there would need to be a medical professional involved in this somewhere along the line in order to remove those organs and store them correctly so they can be used again. Again, that can be a medical professional that is very corrupt and is being paid a large amount of money to do that. Or again, it could be somebody who's being exploited from a different angle yet again. Um, and being forced to do this. So the next slide just shows some of the more common place us, uh, sorry, places around us in our community where we might come across um, modern slavery. The real answer to this is we can see it anywhere around us. It could be happening in the house next door to us right now in the front bedroom and we have no idea. But these are some of the more common places where our team might receive referrals from, for example. I'm now going to pass you on to my colleague um, who's going to go through the second half of this awareness session with you. Thank you for listening. Hello, um, MNS speaking. So I'm going to be covering the signs and indicators of modern slavery. I'm going to talk a bit about the modern slavery strategy um, and referral pathways and the national referral mechanism. So a lot of these signs and indicators Sherry has already touched on in her presentation. Um, and there's a few in addition to this that I think would be quite important to mention. So in relation to someone's exploitation, the signs might be there. So if somebody's being exploited sexually, they might be signs in relation to their presentation very often to medical professionals and sexual health clinics so they might be attending a and e often urgent care center the gp accessing any sort of um, support in relation to their medical conditions or sexual health clinics so they could be presenting with pregnancies unwanted pregnancies multiple need for abortion it could be regular morning after pill they could be presenting at a sexual health clinic requesting condoms in various sizes on a weekly basis and a large amount of those indicating it's not your average kind of consensual relationship. It could be that they're presenting with injuries from the waist down, um, bruising and pains and aches. It could be urinary tract infections on a regular basis, um, incontinence. In relation to someone who's been um, exploited in relation to labour exploitation. It could be someone that's been used to work on a car in a car wash. So they could be presenting at medical professionals with um, cracked and broken skin. It could be that they're not wearing appropriate footwear or appropriate clothing, which is absorbing the dampness. So they're getting skin infections and irritations, calluses, um, rashes, whatever it may 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 seem. Um, for someone who's being exploited for domestic servitude, it could be that that person very rarely leaves their house. It could be that they are not sleep, they don't have appropriate sleeping arrangements. Um, they could be only their restriction, their movement by be so restricted that they are only allowed to leave the house if they're chaperoned or if they're doing something within the realms of their exploitation. So dropping the children off to school, picking them up, doing the shopping, no personal time for themselves. Um, it's also important to um, be aware that young uh, people that are coming from abroad, they might have been smuggled here in the back of a lorry and not officially kind of recorded it could be that the exploiter is then using their immigration status as a way of controlling them 
It could be that they're saying to them, don't go seek help or um, attention in any way because you're, no one's going to be interested in your story and they're not going to be willing to support you. All they're interested in is sending you back to where you came from. And as Sherry said, it could be so detrimental and traumatic to that person that that in itself is enough to control them and keep them doing what they're doing. However, in hindsight, adults and children that are at risk of exploitation are entitled to safeguarding and protection under the UK law, irrespective of their immigration status. So they're able to access that support. Um, but this type of control is coupled with people starting to disbelieve in services and have that kind of awareness of not wanting to seek help because they're being fed that story that, that nobody's going to listen to your story. Um, and it's a way of the the exploiters manipulating them to carry on doing what they're doing. Or it could be that someone's um, adults or children might have certain cultural or spiritual beliefs such as juju that the traffickers will use to cultivate that control and fear within them. And with children, we then will question where are these children? So it's not uncommon for children to be sent from certain countries to the UK with the pretense of them getting a better education and a better life. So the parents have sent them over or the caregivers have sent them over to the UK. Where are those parents now? Do you have contact with those parents? Are you able to, are these children in contact with their own parents or the people with parental responsibility? Um, can they communicate with them? Do they get access to speak to them on the phone? Are they registered with GPs, dental practices? Um, health visitors? Are they up to date with all their immunisations? Are they going to school? What's their school records like? Does the school indicate anything? Or are they saying little Johnny comes into school and steals little Jessica sandwiches every day because he doesn't have food? He's constantly falling asleep at his desk. He's lethargic. Um, raising concerns in that way, which could possibly indicate that he's not sleeping properly, be it because he doesn't have sleeping arrangements or that he's constantly on call. Um, also question the person that they're residing with. So they've been sent over to stay with Uncle John. What's Uncle John's status like? Is he residing in a house that's big enough to accommodate another body or is little Johnny sleeping under the kitchen table? Um, also question their financial situation. Can they afford to have another person in the house or is Uncle John in £3,000 of rent arrears, which would indicate that the finances are not stretched enough to cover the cost of their own family? and another additional body. Um, so properties from outside, um, the property occasionally will look um, that if there's broken windows, they are left unfixed, they're just boarded up. The doors don't often look very accommodating with windows in them, just kind of a plain board door. Um, in, so from outside are also security cameras to the property. So we're not talking your average ring doorbell. We're talking cameras at every entrance and exit point of that property, basically looking at who's coming and going in there. Windows with bars on them, restricting um, people's movement in and out of the property. Um, overflowing rubbish bins to the property. So that could be because there's too many residents there. So the bins are not able to... Um, fill the capacity or it could be that the bins have not been collected on bin day but nobody is going to contact the council and let the local authority know that their bins have been collected because or been not been collected because then they will have drawn attention to that property because the refuse people then have to come and collect them specifically for that property drawing their attention to it um, lots of human traffic to the property so that could be because there's lots of residents there could be um, that it's being used as a brothel or to sell drugs so there's lots of coming and going in terms of business usually through the night or it could be that um, there's a high turnover of residents in that property inside so if you get to go inside Blinds down, curtains drawn, windows blacked out. If they're shiny, like a foil film on the window might indicate that there's um, a possibility of it being used as a cannabis factory. Wires tapped into the neighbour's properties might also indicate a cannabis farm being used because they're tapping into the electricity next door to then hide the fact that there's an excessive electricity usage within that property. 
um, rooms in the property that are locked with restricted access. No one's really got a good story in terms of what's behind there. It could be where a victim is being held or victims. It could be that that is the room that they're using to sexually exploit people. It could be that it's being used as the cannabis cultivation room. Um, indication, there's lots of people living there and that they're unrelated. So the tenancy might have Joe Bloggs, his partner and two children on it. But actually, when you go in the property, there's post and mail in various different family names. Um, there could be clothing and items of footwear that are in various different sizes, not for the two people and the two children that are on the tenancy. There could be a lot of sleeping arrangements set up. So when you go in there, you might find every room has three mattresses in it, um, which would indicate that's more so than what's on the tenancy. Um, dirty, cramped, overcrowded, just not the kind of place that you'd really want to eat in, very little in terms of cleaning facilities. Um, food is often provided by the exploiter as well. And the final one, people living and working at the same address, it could be that it is exactly that people are living and working in the same site. So it might be a warehouse where they are holding the people to exploit them for labour and they're doing some sort of picking and packing in there and there's 15 people they're exploiting that are residing in a caravan on the same site. Or it could be that the property is provided by the exploiter, they then get picked, the, the individuals then get picked up at 5am in the morning in a white van, taken to their place of exploitation and then they're returned at 10pm at night same people, same vehicle, dumped back into this house and it's the same cycle Monday to Sunday. So the modern slavery strategy was um, the government response to the issue of modern slavery. Um, it's a model of the four P's which is adopted by the police and forces and also Enfield Council has adopted this as part of their strategy. So it's the four P's, pursue, prevent, protect, prepare. Pursue is the first P, it's the, the actions that encompass the UK's law enforcement response to the problem of modern slavery. So this is both to disrupt and prosecute those involved and responsible. So we're talking your foot soldiers that do the legwork and the more organised crime networks above. This issue of modern slavery remains um, one of the highest priority serious and organised crime threats to the National Crime Agency today because of the scale of it. Um, the second P is prevent. This aims to stop people from committing these offences of modern slavery, but also it aims to help support people from not becoming victims of this offence as well. So it's got a victim offence, a victim strand and an offending strand. Um, where I said before, it's the highest priority, one of the highest priority crimes. This is because of the high level of harm and trauma it causes an individual and also the high cost in prosecuting this type of crime. So on average, the highest crime to prosecute is murder and homicide. Modern slavery prosecutions come second. Average cost about £330,000 per prosecution. Um, the third P, protect. This is the actions that make our UK, the businesses, the economy, workers, employers, employees and individuals less vulnerable of becoming victims of modern slavery. So this is about supply chains as well. Um, in order for this to be successful and for us to succeed in this, we are increasing people's knowledge. So that's the public and private vigilance, uh, private sector's vigilance towards this type of crime to make it difficult for traffickers to succeed in what they're doing. And the final P is the activity focused on reducing the crime, the level of harm caused to victims of modern slavery as a result of their type of exploitation. So this is where the government created the national referral mechanism by which the UK identifies and supports potential victims of modern slavery. The NRM is the government framework set up to, like I said, identify and support victims. So for someone who is referred to this process, they would be eligible 
if it's a positive outcome, they would be eligible for all the features in this slide, such as accommodation, medical treatment. It could be advice on their immigration and legal rights within the UK. It could be advice on the criminal justice system because they might have been arrested as part of a county line's um, exploitation, or it could be that they were arrested in a cannabis farm and they're being prosecuted for cultivating cannabis. But actually, because this is in um, this is because of their exploitation, they have certain other legal rights. So this is where they would get that support. It's an online portal. The hyperlink is on that slide. It's run by the single competent authority within the Home Office. So they're the independent government body who make decisions on the referrals of people who are potentially deemed to be victims. It runs across all four nations of the UK and it employs staff who are in the heart of the decision making process with the aim of lifting victims out of these exploitative situations and providing them with short periods of intense support and specialist care to basically put them in the position where they can rebuild their lives but also give them the resilience against further exploitation because it's not uncommon for someone to be exploited more than once in their lifetime. The NRM is a journey. Um, it's from the point of referral. So I'm going to speak as myself as a local authority worker. I'm deemed to be a first responder, which I will go to into a bit more detail in the next slide. So as a first responder, I have a legal duty under Section 52 of the Modern Slavery Act to make a referral where I feel there's information that may suggest somebody could be a potential victim. So the referral goes to the single competent authority via the electronic portal. They then have five days to make an initial decision, which is the reasonable grounds decision as to well as to whether they think there's a possibility that this person is a victim. So it's a, a very low burden of proof. It's I suspect but cannot prove. So you put as much information as possible into this portal. The referral gets sent off. The decision then comes back as a positive decision. They then enter the reflection and recovery support period for a minimum of 45 days. This is where the single competent authority will investigate further into this um, potential concerns of modern slavery. It's not uncommon for this be to be months and possibly even years. The single competent authority will then come back with the final decision, which is the conclusive grounds decision as to whether they think there's um, enough evidence to suggest that this person was a victim of modern slavery. If it's a positive outcome, that individual will then receive a further 45 days of support minimum, which could then be extended if needed. If it's a negative outcome, they will receive nine, day, nine days of support basically to move forward with whatever decision it is they want to do, whether it's to be supported to be returned back home, whether it's to be assisted to apply for their immigration status, apply for benefits, whatever it may be. Um, it's important to point out that the exploitation doesn't need to have occurred in the UK at that time for them to be eligible for this referral. It could be anywhere in the world and it could be historic. And if they're in the UK now, they are eligible for this NRM process. With um, someone that has no recourse to public funds, as I said, their immigration status is irrelevant when their safeguarding is being questioned. However, depending on what happens during this NRM process and what the outcome is, it may then become relevant. Hence the support for immigration, hence the support for the immigration assistance. So for someone to be referred to the NRM, consent is not required, uh, consent is not required for an individual under the age of 18. So if it's a child, there is no need for consent. It is a straight national referral mechanism referral to the NRM. If it's an adult, they need to give consent to be referred to this process. It needs to be informed. They need to be aware of what they're signing up for, the potential implications of this referral and the potential outcomes of this referral. Um, if they give their consent, fantastic. It goes through the electronic portal. If they do not give consent under Section 52 of the Modern Savory Act, a first responder such as myself is still duty bound to notify the Secretary of State of this 
concerns of unsavoury. So it's done via the duty to notify form, also known as the DTN. Um, it's exactly the same electronic portal as the NRM. The only difference is that the DTN is an anonymised version. So the same information is pumped into the system, except for the um, identifying features such as the name and date of birth, etc. We do request that anybody that's making a referral to the NRM or the DTN system to the Home Office, they could kindly let our team know on that email address on the slide because we are doing a mapping exercise where we are mapping trends and pockets of modern slavery concerns and crimes in the borough to see if there's anywhere we need to focus our attention on in terms of um, resources. Okay, so as I mentioned, national referral mechanisms, uh, NRM referrals can only be filled in by first responders. Local authorities are one, and this is a list of other first responders within the service that can make these referrals. Um, and people can make referrals on their on others' behalf. So we work alongside the NHS and we support our NHS colleagues where they have concerns by making those referrals alongside them in conjunction. So nobody is missed. So referral pathways. If there's concerns about an adult or a child victim where you think that there's potential they're being treated as modern slaves or there's concerns, the initial referral needs to go via the relevant MASH team. So adult to adult, child to child. The referral details are all on this, on this slide for you for easy access. If it's concerns in relation to a location, a business, a house, somebody four doors from you has 15 people living in their garage and they receive deliveries every day and there's like a picking and packing service going on there and it doesn't seem right that referral will come to our team at modern savory and the telephone number is there as well for you to share those concerns um, again if you do make referrals to mash teams please do copy our team in or notify us as again for this ongoing tracking and for our trends exercise that we're doing and in response to the pandemic in April 2020, the team set up a helpline. Um, the telephone number is there along with the email address. We set this helpline up as a uh, um, for the first point of access for people to make inquiries to our team, both the public and professional to seek support or advice, or if you had kind of something that you wasn't too sure about and you just wanted to run by someone, then please do use us. The line is running and it will continue to run thereafter. Um, it's for anybody to raise any concerns in relation to modern slavery. It's always manned between 10 and 2, Monday to Friday, and um, we, we, we're here to support you. And likewise, if you have any questions in relation to this presentation today, we do then kindly ask that you email us or call us and we will help you as much as possible. Um, thank you for listening today and we hope you've taken away enough information from here.